Good morning. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, Jordan. No, I clicked the wrong thing. Our school is not being my friend right now. I mean, it's never really my friend. <laughs> Good morning, Soraya. Good morning, who else joined? Wait, while well, I was fighting with power school. Oh, it's Siri. Good morning. I just created a remind. I know it's a little late, but I finally figured out how to make one. I can't get it to work on my phone, but. Good morning, Justice. Let's see, Justice, Soraya. Jordan. Of course, they're picking up my garbage now, so it's like so loud outside. There you go. Good morning, Yolanda. So how are you guys doing? You guys have any plans for the weekend? Not really. Yeah, me either. I'm going to try to decorate a little bit. And I'm going to go to the um, Bath and Body Works sale and get my mom a candle. Binge watching? What are you going to binge watch? Is there anything in particular? Good morning, Austin. Good morning, Portland. Good morning, Ethan. Good morning, Miguel. Good morning, Jasimi. It's okay that you're late. You're not really late. I mean, you're on time. It's still 11.08. Morning, Delilah. Who else? Make sure I got everybody. This power school doesn't want to behave. You're rewatching Naruto. Nice. Last night I watched, what did we watch? Oh, Scrooged. That was the... Christmas movie that we watched last night um, and it was pretty <laughs> it is pretty weird yeah we're gonna go ahead and do Nearpod um, let me post it there you go um, and then tonight we're watching Fred Claus which I've never seen but we'll see how it is I mean, I haven't watched most Christmas movies, so <laughs> saying that I've never seen it isn't really that extraordinary. Good morning, Eric. We're gonna wait a couple more minutes. I will post the Nearpod again in just a second. 
Um, let me see. Yep, Austin, I see you. You're welcome. Good morning, Zach. And Fabian is joining. Power school is not cooperating, which isn't great because I wanted to put in all my grades today. Giselle. The Nearpod for today. Here it is. Go ahead and join while I fight with. I'm waging a war against our school. Let me put in attendance. I'm missing somebody. We're missing the Kennedys, which usually they're usually here. We're missing Jennifer, Maya, Zachary. Nope, Zach's here. Let me check you off. There's Maya in the waiting room. There's Gabriel. I'm like afraid to hit submit because then it won't let me do anything. There's Clarissa. All right, for those of you who have just joined, there's the Nearpod. Thank you, Austin, for sharing that. I appreciate it. So yeah, today we're gonna talk about directing. Um, again, sort of in a broad way that we talked about acting the other day. And then we will, next week we're going to do, let me see, what do we have on the, what do we have on the schedule for next week? We're doing, Oh, designers, so sound, lights, costume, all that fun stuff. And then the very last week, we're going to watch The King and I, our reward for having made it through. Um, one thing that I do want to, again, remind you is that um, if you did not turn in your RPA paper, I have to have it by Sunday, by midnight. Um, if I don't get it, you can't get a grade. You should be able to now see your grades in Schoology, which should give you an indication of what your grade was. And uh, if you want to redo your paper for a better grade, or if you need to turn it in at all, I got very few papers from this class. Um, uh, Delilah, the last week before Christmas, we are currently scheduled to be, um, we are currently scheduled to go back to school or offer the same like hybrid. Um, however, I don't know what's going to happen because of the rise in coronavirus numbers. But right now the plan is that we would, there, there would be that return to, um, to hybrid. So if you have been or want to do hybrid, that would be an option again for the final week. Um, so here again, Nearpod link. Thank you, Austin. Um, let me double check about tests. Let me see. Because I know there was a conversation about tests for ninth graders. Um, it looks like biology 
It's happening on the 14th and the 15th and Algebra 1 on the 16th and the 17th. Um, so I'm not 100% sure if those are in person or if they're virtual or if they're hybrid. So I, what I would do is reach out to your advisor um, and they should be able to get you that information. You are very welcome, no problem. All right, we should have most people in the near pod, right? Looks like, yes, it looks like most people are. Oh, there's Kennedy. One Kennedy, two Kennedys, three Kennedys, four. Good morning, good morning, good morning. All right, so let's get in the near pod and let us discuss directing, hooray. Okay, so we're gonna talk about like what directors do, like what's their job. Um, we're gonna talk about how directing has like changed, right? from the beginning to now, like, you know, obviously what a contemporary director does is quite a bit different from what, you know, it was previously. Um, we're going to watch a video where a director talks about their process, and then you will respond to it, and then we have an exit ticket, okay? So pretty typical schedule for us today. All right. So what is directing? So anybody want to volunteer to read this slide for us, please? Okay, Austin, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so the slide in your part, right? Yep. What is directing decision making? Responsible for final decisions for creative choices, collaborator, unifying all production elements, and visionary bringing a specific idea to the production to make it unique. Perfect. Yes. Okay. So the first thing is that the director is basically responsible for the final like decisions, right? So at the end of the day, if there is like any problems between creative like choices or any confusion on like what you know should be done, the director is the one who says, this is what we're going with, right? They also are meant to, you know, unify all of the production elements. So again, you know, let's say your costume director and your set director don't agree on a particular idea, um, the director is the one who sort of makes the final decision and tries to get people to work together, right? Have you guys ever had to do that for like a group project? Maybe there's two people in your group and they don't, yes. yeah, they, yeah. They don't really agree on the way that things should go or what something should look like. Anybody else? I do. Well, I think I already said I did, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty common thing, right? So think about that, but on a major scale, right? Which is something that, you know, happens a lot in, um, in most jobs. You have to, like, get people to work together, right? And then... They do bring something to creative of their own, a vision, right? A concept that is unique for their production. So let's talk about how this developed through history. Who would like to read this slide for us? Okay. 
Thank you. Um, 18th Theater. Playwrights would originally direct their own plays. Medieval Theater. Pageant managers would watch the script and help with lines. Elizabeth, Elizabethan. Actor managers, the senior actor got to pick the script and stage it. Neoclassical idea of someone responsible for vision became popular because play, playwrights were long dead. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So in the beginning, right, like we talked about with ancient Greece and ancient Rome, there wasn't really anybody to do the directing. So the playwright was the one responsible for making those decisions, right? Makes sense. Now, do you guys remember who was responsible, at least originally, for doing the plays in medieval theater? Like, where were they being done? Yeah, like who was directing them, who was like um, acting in the scripts, like where were they coming from? In the medieval theater. Priest churches yes yeah right they were they were being done in the church do you guys remember that so the pageant manager is just watching the script now why would it be so important that those plays that the the lines be done as they were written What were they based off of? Yeah, they, there wasn't a stage director yet, but where, what were the scripts themselves based off of during this time? They were based off something specific, like a specific book. Medieval theater, they're being done in the church. Why were they doing the plays? Why was the church putting on these plays? Because playwrights were dead or, so, or playwrights were dead? Well, we didn't have any playwrights at the time, correct, right? Why was the church doing plays during medieval theater? What was the, like, what were they trying to do? Okay, I want everybody to think about this. The church was putting on plays, right? Why, what were they trying to teach with the plays? Ah, thank you, Delilah, to teach religion, right? The plays were based on the Bible, okay? So that's why the lines had to be correct, right? 
because they are based on stories from the Bible. Okay. So that's why we have, we have to create this job for somebody to, in the rehearsal process, make sure the actors are, are saying the lines the way that they're written, right? Because these stories come from God, according to them, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, they're remembering, right? They were using the theater to teach about the Bible, right? And so this is, you know, how people are learning about these stories. They can't read the Bible themselves, right? Because they don't read Latin. Here's the Nearpod. There's several of you who are not in it. So they are instead learning through watching these plays, okay? Then we get to the Elizabethan theater, like when Shakespeare was writing, right? And essentially, this is where we begin having someone who's called an actor manager, where the senior actor gets to basically pick the script they want to do, and they cast it themselves. So they're obviously, they're going to pick plays that they want to be the main role of, right? And they cast it and direct it themselves. So it's not until Neo, yeah, well, the oldest actor or whoever was sort of the star at the time, right? Whoever was like the most popular person um, had a lot of control over what they were going to do. This is called, and I'm going to type it in because it's going to come back, the star system. You guys like know how, um, I think I've talked about this before, but I don't know if it was in this class, how they'll cast like somebody in a movie because they bring in audience members, right? You forgot about the star system? Yeah, right? It's, it's the same idea. Um, you know, whoever's the most popular actor, they're gonna feature them the most because then pe people wanna see them act. Then we get to neoclassicism, right? Which is new classics, right? This is when they're starting to rediscover what? I'm sorry, Austin, yes? Wait, what, what? Oh, I'm sorry, neoclassicism, number four. Neo means new, right? New classics. So they are going back, they're rediscovering these ancient Greek and ancient Roman plays. This is when the three unities happens, right? And they can't just like call up Sophocles and be like, hey, Sophocles, how am I supposed to stage Oedipus Rex, right? So there's nobody who can do that. And this is the first time that it sort of gets this idea that like, maybe we should have somebody whose only job is to look at like how this play looks and sounds to the audience, right? So when they're doing these older plays by ancient Greek and ancient Roman writers, Somebody's got to make these decisions. And that somebody is going to be the director. Any questions on this progression? Yep, exactly, Austin. Are you outside, Austin? We need to get you some gloves. Oh no. So pretty, pretty clear progression throughout history, okay? So this leads to one specific person that most people attribute modern directing to. And that is Duke 
George II of Saxe-Meiningen from Germany in 1866. So who would like to read this slide for us, please? Okay, go ahead, Austin, sure. Okay, so, ow, ow, I'm, I'm sorry, I just hurt myself, sorry about that. It's okay. Um, Duke George II of Saxe Meiningen. Mine again, yep. Mine again, okay. 1886 Germany used re re realistic lightning and stage design, developed a symbol acting, used historically accurate costumes, and toured many European cities until 1890 and inspired many young directors, actors, and new theater companies. Perfect, yes. So Duke George II, he was a Duke. He had a lot of money. He was a member of the royalty, right? He loved theater, but he wanted to do theater his own way. He wanted to do it a very specific way. And because he had the money, he could. So he basically, what he basically did is he just like went around and talked to all the people who like worked in his province and discovered who the best actors were and cast them. Is, yeah. Is this for all theater or just G G Germany theater? G uh, well, it's going to start in Germany. Yep. Okay. Good question. And he, um, he makes a cast. And he wants to use lighting that looks like it happens in real life. He wants to use real sets. So like if the play takes place at a dining room table, like we should have a table and chairs and people should be able to sit down in them, right? Now he develops ensemble acting. What does ensemble mean? Anybody know? What does, and I'll put it in the chat, what does ensemble mean? Okay, so Soraya posed for us a group of musicians, actors, or dancers who perform together, okay? Good. So what I want you to think about, we just talked a group, right? We just talked about the star system, right? Where you would have like somebody who is the best, right? And everybody else sort of underneath them. Well, the idea of working as an ensemble means that we're instead, we're going to cast the person who is best for the role no matter if they are like um, brand new to the troupe or have been there for a long time. So you might play the lead in one play and then in the next play, maybe you're the butler, right? It all, it's all cast based on like, who's the best person for the role. Everybody is at the same like level there's no stars, there's no, you know, right? He's also going to start using historically accurate costumes. Now, this was pretty important because previously, if you were on stage, everybody was like, everybody was dressed to the nines, right? Everybody looked incredible. Even if you were playing like, yes, exactly, Austin. Even if you were playing like um, a maid or a uh, someone who was supposed to be homeless, you would still be dressed in these gorgeous costumes, right? He's going to get rid of that. He's like, you should be dressed based on who your character is, okay? So they're going to take this and start touring around not just Germany, but all over Europe. And this was very inspirational. It was new. A lot of young directors and actors and brand new theater companies were really inspired by this new way to do a play, right? To make plays look 
closer to real life and like the, than they had before. Uh, yes, we do have plays in North America by this time. So I don't think, let me, do, let me see. Sex, mine again, touring theater. I don't think they ever got to America, but I'm going to double check right now. Wow. I just saw a picture of him. Dude is intense looking here. I'm going to post it in uh, the, the chat so you can look at his picture. <laughs> uh, 35 European cities. So it doesn't look like they ever got to, uh, they got to London, but it doesn't look like they ever went to America. Yeah, he's got quite the beard. So they tour all over Europe and they sort of show what this does. And it sort of then become, it's the beard. Yeah, that like sort of triangle looking. <laughs> um, but, they, but everybody gets really inspired by this. And this really sort of becomes the norm um, for theater for a long time. He looks like mean Santa Claus. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and um, watch this interview. So we're going to watch an interview with a director uh, named James Lapine. He directed the Broadway revival of Annie. Uh, and he's going to talk about sort of his approach to directing, uh, his favorite part of directing. Um, so let's go ahead and watch that. And you can all watch it on your own devices and then Take some notes. We're going to talk about it afterwards. Oh, oh, that's right. It doesn't work on here. I forgot. Let me grab the link. Here's the link for you. There you go. Um, it's on because for some reason the school blocked it, even though it was PBS, because, you know, why not? So go ahead and watch this. Let me know when you're finished.
All right, great. So as you're finishing, you can go ahead in the collaborate board and first of all, talk about what it means for a director to give notes. Yeah, it's nice to hear it from a professional, right? You know, like from somebody who works on Broadway. Uh, and it's really cool for somebody who works on Broadway to give their time to PBS to do this kind of stuff for free, you know, give interviews like this. Am I finding more Santa Claus? I hope not. <laughs> Watches the play and takes notes for improvement or other things to work on and feedback. Okay, good. To watch the play, give the actors pointers on what they did good and what they could improve on. Good. give their point of view. That's part of it. Yeah, absolutely. So go ahead and type your response about this in the Nearpod, please. Critic, so you can see what you need to work on to make the performance good. That's a good way to think about it, uh, Delilah. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that he mentions is that he goes every two weeks after opening night, right? Which is actually a lot. Um, but it's partially because he lives in New York City, right? So he can go fairly often to give feedback. For some other directors, they might only come back when like a brand new person takes over like an important role. Uh, new York City. Or they might let their assistant director do the notes. So it really depends on the director, how involved they are in the process once the actual performances begin. So like, did you guys check on, like, did you hear where you said like, that it's really the job of the, of the assistant director or the associate director to keep things day to day and the stage manager? Right. So professional directors, once it gets to that point, like for instance, um, the Lion King, right, has been on Broadway for, when did the Lion King premiere on Broadway? So it premiered on Broadway in night, no, that's pu publication. Yeah, 1997, okay. And obviously like the director for the Broadway production hasn't like continued to go back to watch Broadway on a regular basis probably, right? Um, it's probably more likely that, you know, the people who, the, the stage managers they're the ones at this point who run that production. Okay, so here's our second part. So I want everybody to answer this one. It's a play on, on Broadway, The Lion King. 
So what did he say about tech rehearsals and why they're the most exciting part of the process to him? So what is a tech rehearsal and why does he think they're so exciting? I'll go at the end to the last question. Sorry about that. Yeah, you did. Oh, I did. I did. Okay. Okay. Yep, you're good. I tell my other response in the chat. I got your response. Oh, okay. 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 Yep, you're good. So it's for the benefit of the technical operators, for the design and the, the director and the design team. Yep, that's a big part of it for sure. You guys okay? Everybody awake? Is it Friday and everybody's just checked out? I'm just not getting a lot of responses as well. Technical logical aspects of the performance, the lights, the music, that's, de uh, that's a big part of it for sure. It's the first time we get to see all of that stuff together, right? Who else is involved? He finds them exciting. Yeah, because you see it all together for the first time. Good, excellent job. So I've got responses from Delilah and Austin and Justice. I haven't heard anything from anybody else though. <laughs> yep, Austin, you are very good at participation. I appreciate that. Usually you guys are like really, really jamming out, but today everybody seems a little sleepy, huh? Clarissa, the tech rehearsals help them get it right. Yeah. To all the elements you've been learning, the main stage and the lighting and audio. Good. Yes, Miguel, you're correct. It is also a time when we have to figure out if things are um, potentially dangerous. So in the documentary for this production of Annie, they're looking at this thing that they've cut out under the stage and it has this big like angle. And they're like, well, how could you hurt yourself on that, right? And the... <laughs> the choreographer is like uh you impale your whole leg on it because th these are kids <laughs> and he like runs and like almost like jumps into the thing and they're like oh yeah maybe we should cut that off <laughs> like <laughs> so <laughs> like you know you, sometimes you need people from outside of the designers to look at something and be like hey that's not going to work. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite parts in the whole documentary is when the choreographer is like, you, you break your whole, <laughs> you break your whole leg on it because these are like little kids and they're going to hurt themselves on anything. <laughs> All right. So the goal of the modern director is to take what the playwright gives them in the script and combine that with their own ideas, the talents of the actors, the creative design team, you're creating a unique performance for a brand new audience, right? So that's your goal. Taking your creative energy, the actor's creative energy, the designer's creative energy, this text, no matter how old the text is and 
creating that into like a brand new performance. So here, I just wanted to give you, if you had to like if distill the jobs of the director down to six things, this is what they would be. You have to select or create a script. You decide how you're going to interpret that script, the vision that you have for the production. You have to cast the actors for the roles. You have to work with all of those other creative artists, choreographers, designers. Obviously, you have to run rehearsals and then you're responsible for all of the coordination of every single element and making all of those final decisions. Any big questions about the director, anything that you're confused about, anything that you were not expecting, like, No, it's pretty clear. So it's a lot of work, right? Um, which is why it's, you know, it, it's very difficult to direct and it's even more difficult to direct well. Okay, well, I just opened up the exit ticket for you. So you can go ahead and take the exit ticket when you're ready. Okay, thank you, Jaden. Yes, it is recorded. I'll be posting it uh, as soon as I can after we finish class. As I, I always try to post it very quickly, but um, sometimes Sometimes it doesn't load very quickly, but it's better when I'm at home because I have fiber internet here at home and I'm directly connected. So got that ethernet cord. So go ahead and take the exit ticket. And in a second, I am going to make sure that I can see that you are in the exit ticket. And then before I forget, I know that it's near the end of the semester, but I did finally figure out how to make a remind. Um, so I wanted to give you guys the code for that uh, in case you have any last minute questions as you're working on your RPA papers or I know. So here's the deal. I was trying to do it on my phone because I thought you could only do it on a phone, right? And every time I tried to do it on my phone, it just like kept repeating this one step over and over and over again. And I couldn't get it to go to the next step. It would just like try to make, what did it say? Like an office account or something on my phone. So now I figured out that there's a website and you can make a website and I did, but I tell you what I'll do. I'll convert this to like, we'll keep it for next semester so that when you guys are taking art, if you want to talk to me, you can, there it is F22 BCA. I did learn something new today. <laughs> I legitimately thought it was just a mobile app. Like I didn't know that it wasn't. And then one of the teachers was like, well, like I use Remind, but I don't install it. I don't have it on my phone. And I was like, how? <laughs> so 
Don't shame me. You do have three attempts now to take um, to take the the exit ticket as well. Yes, I can, Kennedy. Give me one second. Boop. There we go. I never, I didn't even know what Remind was. I've never used Schoology before this semester or Nearpod or Remind or PowerSchool. These are all new to me. It's a good thing I wasn't teaching. You still have old middle school ones. <laughs> it's a good thing that like I wasn't teaching like new subject matter because this would have been a very, even more stressful semester. You, you do too? Yeah, I, I, I have never, ever, ever used it before. We just, have, I just have Blackboard for like my college classes. So. So make sure that you're doing your exit ticket, please. Um, okay, uh, what slide do you need, Austin? Are you using the one in Schoology or the one that I have up right this second? In the one in Schoology? Oh yeah, the one in, that's up like here doesn't, um, you can't control it, only I can. So you just let me know what you're looking for. You have to go to the one in Schoology in order to control it yourself. Oh, um, this one, I have this one up, Ancient Theater, that one is up right now. So if you are done with the exit ticket, you are free to go. If you have any questions, you can stick around. One well, school G's not working. That's weird. I wonder if it's because I'm logged into it right this second. Let me see. I bet that's why. Uh, I know what I'll do. If you're trying to, yeah, I have a Twitch. Well, I don't, I use my Twitch occasionally, like my personal Twitch. Um, 